please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. All right, but before we do that, let's take a check at what the Asian markets are doing right now. The Hong Kong and Chinese markets gained for six straight sessions, but we are waiting for them to open right now. But if you take a look at the Nikkei, that one is down about four tenths of a percent. Remember, it hit a 26 year high in yesterday's trading session. Nikkei, that is, the Japanese data came by and the imports, they were up 15 percent. The exports up 9.3 percent versus estimates of about 10 percent. So no real worries there. But what is the bit of a worry is the kind of strengthening that we're seeing in the dollar yen. 110.13 is where it settled at. Yesterday, post, uh, uh, post the announcement that came in from the Bank of Japan, that one did go ahead and hit the handle of a 111 versus the dollar. The Korean market's absolutely flat as we speak. If you take a look at uh, the Straits as well as the Taiwanese indices, both of them also s showing no real cuts, barring the Taiwanese index, which is actually down about half a percent. The SGX Nifty, remember, we're at record highs, indicates maybe we'll pull back a mild bit, but then again, nothing to complain as far as our markets are concerned. Okay, so that's uh, as far as Asia goes. Let's just rewind back and see what happened overnight on Wall Street. In the U.S. markets uh, uh, were on a higher footing, largely speaking, though the end was a little mixed on the indices. The Nasdaq and the S&P 500 closed at record highs as the corporate earnings season rolled on. Netflix saw a 10% surge, lifting the company's market cap above $100 billion for the first time. And why not? Because the number of subscribers they've added was way past the estimates. And I'm sure there are a lot of contributors there from countries like ourselves as well. Stranger Things, <laughs> that was the one that I, uh, I I read about, that the one that caused the spike in sp all the subscribers, 8 million So people. you played your part in the 10% stock surge? Obviously. I did, I did. Okay, all right. All right. Well, let's get you uh, CNBC's Hampton Pearson's report. Stocks finishing mixed, the Dow down by three points, the S&P up six, the Nasdaq higher by 52 points. Shares of Apple getting tagged thanks to a note from J.P. Morgan saying iPhone X orders are weak. The analyst predicts manufacturers of Apple's most expensive phone might be down 50 percent quarter over quarter and that overall the high-end smartphone marketplace might be plateauing. Apple still finishing in positive territory, though down sharply from its highs of the day. More companies sharing tax reform benefits with employees. The aforementioned J.P. Morgan Chase says it'll kick off a new $20 billion investment program that will boost wages for around 22,000 employees by an average of 10 percent. The bank will also hire 4,000 people to help staff 400 new Chase Bank branches in new cities. Meanwhile, Verizon saying many of its workers will receive 50 shares of restricted stock and Disney giving 125,000 of its employees a one-time $1,000 cash bonus. Duke Energy says President Trump's solar panel tariffs could hurt the utility's use of solar to deliver power to its customers cheaply. South Carolina says it could lose 7,000 jobs because of that move. That's the action from the U.S. markets. Back to you in Mumbai. All right, then let's move on to the European uh, indices. The CAC, DAX, as well as the FTSE managed to end the session by uh, a narrow gain in the green, as well as investors reacted to the news of the end of the three-day government shutdown in the U.S. So we got uh, good news coming in from most of the indices. The German index, again, outperforming for the third particular session. That was primarily because of uh, hopes of a consolidation in their political arena, some sort of development taking place. Maybe they have a stable government or not. The stock that is leading that index higher is Adidas, was up 7% day before yesterday, up in trade yesterday's trading session too. But in the emerging markets back, we had the Russian index. That one was down about 0.12%. That was primarily this uh, on account, or uh, uh, rather, that was despite the so, sort of uh, moves that we saw on Brent. The Brazilian index down about 1.2 percent, and that again, despite the sort of rally that we saw in the metal stocks yesterday. Okay, and as we have been telling you, Asian indices have been uh, trading mixed in early morning trade. The dollar continues to slide against the yen as well as the euro, actually. The rally uh, of yesterday has pretty much subsided. You can see it's very precariously placed now. At the 90 handle, that's the dollar index. Um, it's a multi-year low for that particular in this, uh, index. Now, a rising consumer confidence in Europe has also added to the weakness on the greenback. In the world of commodities, crude oil prices grained last night with the benchmark Brent crude hitting $70 a barrel for the first time in a week. 
boosted by healthy world economic growth prospects and expectations for continued production curbs by the OPEC Russia and other allies. On that note, let's also hear out what Bob Dudley, the CEO of British Petroleum, has to say on the rising oil demand. Stock levels are continuing to come down. Demand has come up, uh, probably more. We see it in the economic growth. But I do think we'll see the shale come back on, moderate this as a shock absorber a little bit. We're still going to play on 55 it, to 60. Well, with a low price, you create more demand. So as the price goes up, some of that demand will moderate a little bit. But uh, the fundamentals have been OPEC has pulled production off the market. And the stock levels will come down, probably hit the five-year average uh, this year sometime. I think there's some discipline back in the U.S. with cash. People have been using the cash, plowing it right back into things, and people have been putting some pressure, I think, on the U.S. side to create some more returns. So they're a little more reluctant. But you can see it building up in the, in the well inventory and stuff, and I expect U.S. production to rise again. It is coming up, but there could be another million barrels a day this year, 10 million barrels a day. We've got a lot on our plate. You know, we're pretty disciplined now after what happened with our capital frameworks and stuff. So we've got a plan. We've got lots to do. So it was record tumbling day on the Lal Street yesterday, and we've been in that kind of a zone for a while now, haven't we? So the last close, you saw both those indices, 36,000 plus on the Sensex and 11,000 plus on the Nifty. In fact, the Nifty now taking aim at 11,100 so quickly. It's also expiry week. We're just one day away from that event. So what should we watch out for today? What's the setup looking like? We have Naveen Shetty joining in with his synopsis. Naveen. Good, good morning, morning. Surbhi. Good morning. So, yeah, ahead of the next big trigger is expiry. But mm -hmm. just look at how the trade panned out yesterday. It's clearly all positive signals. We had uh, we broke record highs and reached that 11,000 mark on the Nifty, 36,000 mark on the Sensex. In fact, if you see both the major indices, the other ones like the Bank Nifty as well as Midcap, they were moving in tandem both in the positive terrain itself. Also, if you see uh, going ahead post the market, we got the fund flows also, institutional fund flows. Both were again positive. If you see the cash market uh, data, FIS bought close to 1,300 crore and the DIS also bought close to 170 crore on the stock futures also, they were buying from the FIS of close to 970 crores. So going ahead today, we are going into the trade with all uh, b uh, with maximum amount of positive cues that we can see. On the other hand, if you see the uh, levels, 11,000 now seems to be like a base for the uh, Nifty, given the fact that the maximum put, uh, put addition happened at the 11,000 levels at around 31 lakh shares. Remember, the premium over year has also squeezed from those 60 rupees level to 22. But keep an eye that tomorrow is the expiry day. On the other hand, uh, one more key point to watch out will be the PCR at around 189 uh, versus 1.73. This is at record high, but again, one more point to remember is that tomorrow will be your uh, 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 by, uh, expiry, FNO expiry. On the other hand, global markets, they seem to be lackluster. Uh, European indices, not, uh, not much to talk about. The DAX ended up six tenths of a percent, but CACs was also flattish. Dow Jones was also ended on a flattish note, and SGX uh, Nifty indicates a flattish opening for our market itself. But overall, medium term, seems to be positive for the markets. Back to you. All right. Medium term seems to be positive for the markets. But ultra near term, Naveen, today, what are the stocks that you're watching out for? So quite a few mid-cap stocks, small cap to mid-cap stocks will be in focus. Uh, before I begin with the results, there are a few stocks uh, like uh, eClerks. eClerks has announced a buyback of almost 3% uh, to 4% is the acceptance ratio at the price of 2,000 rupees. On the other hand, Alamic has also announced a buyback. The company is expected to buy back close to 10 crore shares at around 80 rupees. Uh, apart from this, a lot of fundraising is happening given the fact that the markets are zooming. So you have Sanghi Industries, which is uh, proved an issue of around 129 rupees. Uh, that is a CMP for the stock. On the other hand, Majesco, uh, the floor price for the QIP is fixed at around 532 rupees. Apart from this, some expansion coming in for Guinness. But, but this is one stock we don't talk much, but has done quite well. Uh, leases manufacturing facility for the production of craft paper. So some capex over there. Wipro is also one stock which will be in focus given the fact that they have won an award. Apart from this, uh, a lot of stocks will be buzzing on the back of results that they posted yesterday post-market. Shemaru Entertainment, what a run that uh, stock has seen, almost 35% in the last two sessions. And clearly, uh, the numbers also have been showing that revenue growth of 20, 17%, but operating margins have also been maintained at the higher end of around 27%. On the other hand, Swaraj engines also have been posting good set of numbers. Uh, the EPS over there has jumped close to 15% at around 13 rupees, and the PAT has jumped 12%. Uh, 
uh, Sinjin International, again, a uh, subsidiary of Biocon, that has posted good set of numbers, revenue up 17%. Operating margins have also remained stable around those 33% levels. Uh, Rapfila International, last quarter was good for this company, but this uh, quarter seems to be not that great, given the fact that the margins have been down close to 250 basis point at 9.5%. NK Wheels, again, a company in the aluminum casting business, margins have zoomed to 8.8%. Remember, this is a jump of close to 200 basis points for the stock. On the other hand, Nucleus Software, good set of numbers continue for the la third or fourth quarter, in fact. EBITDA has jumped close to 32% and margins are 200 basis points. Wapco International, again, the streak of these auto ancillary companies in terms of good results seems to be continuing. Margins are uh, uh, almost steady, but the revenue is up close to 33% for Wapco India. Back to you. Okay, all right. Naveen, thanks very much for that. You track a lot of these mid-cap IT companies. They've been coming up with blowout numbers this quarter, right? So let's see if that streak can continue. The World Economic Forum currently underway at Davos, and we at CNBC TV18 have been getting you all the top voices from there. After the ONGC-HPCL deal, expect further consolidation in India's oil and gas sector. That's the word coming in from Petroleum Minister Dharmendra Pradhan in a conversation with Shireen Bhan. Pradhan also spoke about Saudi Aramco's interest in investing in the mega refinery that's coming up in Maharashtra's Ratnagiri. Listen in. Speaking of investment specifically into the oil and gas sector, what can we expect, sir, because this is a sector uh, that has seen uh, a bit of a lull in terms of investments. Uh, are we likely to see big ticket FDI return to the oil and gas sector? I'm confident. I'm confident. Not only uh, FDI, a lot of investment will come. Already there are a lot of investment are on already on ground mm. in the Kechi Vishin. In Andhra Pradesh, more than uh, 15 billion investment are on job, on the, on the ground. That apart, we are going to uh, build the biggest ever uh, PSU driven refinery, mm. 60 million ton capacity refinery in West Coast in Ratnagiri. Just now we have started our work in Barmer area where India produced 20 percent of its uh, crude oil. Lot of gas is coming up in that area also. Mm. Now looking into the incremental requirement of India's mm. market. India is uh, the new destination of investment. Mm. Lot of people are coming. Rosneft the last year, the biggest ever investment came to India. Mm. Rosneft invested. Uh, what about Saudi Aramco, sir? They are, they are interested. They are interested for uh, Ratnagiri refinery, for the West Coast refinery. That's one of the agenda I'm talking to my counterpart, Excellency Pali. Mm. Let me ask you about more consolidation, <laughs> HPCL and ONGC uh, done in this fiscal as you had anticipated and as you had told us when we last spoke. What next, sir, in terms of consolidation within your ministry and this your This government sector? is very decisive. What we have promised, what we announced in the last budget, we have already completed that process. Last week we have completed the ONGC HPCL acquisition. It's a very unique and innovative financial integration came up. And as I told, some more may be come up in the near future. Mm -hmm. Have you identified who uh, merges into whom, etc.? What is the... We are interested to create a gas, a grid gas network. So looking into that need, we may have to, we are, we are thinking whether evaluating financially also, mm. how things can unfold. But in future, more consolidation, more integration will be there. Okay, that was Mr. Tulsi Tanti. We also caught up with a whole host of other top corporate leaders. Hear out a slice of those conversations. A lot of Indian jewels are now foreign-owned, and in fact, foreign savers are benefiting uh, from uh, from these companies. Uh, you said that the policy framework, while it needs to encourage foreign direct investment, also must ensure that we have significantly strong Indian homegrown companies. What do you mean? If we say that in the case of an Indian bank, you have majority foreign ownership mm. uh, in the world where you are aware that global proxy advisors like Glass Lewis and mm. ISS mm. effectively have a disproportionate share mm. how global institutions vote. Mm. Therefore, if majority ownership is mm. maybe even if it is widespread, mm. the two decision makers or influencers yeah. are two global proxy advisors. If Therefore, I we should not fool ourselves okay. that the decision-making effectively has got much more centralized 
in the effectively in the hands of global proxy advisors irrespective of individual individual holding in companies so foreign direct investment 100% if at all for the banking sector we don't know if it's going no, to happen my, or I not think you, to, you you believe that that is my, a complete you got no. to divide it into two parts okay one is if foreign banks want to set up wholly owned indian subsidiaries i think that's a separate policy and that is different and i think that should be fine within the framework of uh, of reciprocity and everything else but to say that we call ourselves indian private sector banks and then we say that okay 100% foreign ownership is okay but we are indian private sector banks that's not on <laughs> is becoming more and more linked to business mm. so the kind of spending that you see is a lot more dynamic compared to more static kind of annual uh, annual budgeting mm. based fund so mm. that was what i was alluding mm. to mm. and uh, this whole shift to agile is something that we are very significantly uh, embracing mm. and we think that we are leading the way in terms of going to what we call a 100% agile world what's the plan in terms of fleet acquisition how soon can we expect yeah. you to take your well, international plans i think we're on plans? a we're on a there we're on a rush now we now feel you know for many years i said it's not about getting there it's about mm. doing it right mm. we're now putting the foot on the accelerator mm. when now which means how many aircraft well, how soon well we're, we're we're hoping to get to 20 by august or so of uh, of 2018 domestic you know through all the mm. tough time my friends have given mm. me in the airline industry we've got better in domestic and domestic is actually what is the current market share Um we are still very small we're yeah. about 5% yeah. um of the market share but interesting enough in the Air Asia group this year if we deliver what we say we're going to do mm. India will be number 3 in our group okay. uh I think I think what the government is doing is absolutely right though mm. it's time that uh, we stop wasting uh, taxpayer money on air india mm. and uh, it's it's a great brand and can be a great force multiplier uh, that company if it's managed well and so we hope that somebody uh, who buys it will make sure that uh, they strengthen the company and mm. improve the brand we are expanding uh, our uh, main capacities particularly in uh, next generation of the technologies and enhancing the our uh, the plant load factors from 35% to 45% to bring down the levelized cost of energy down and for that we are investing in the next generation of the the turbine technology which is a 2.6 uh, megawatt machines and 128 meter rotors 140 meters tower which will deliver the almost 45% plf which is never india has achieved that